With the release of Helldivers 2 and its seemingly overnight sensational influence over the internet, its inspirational material is making a bit of a comeback. Before any drop pod concept of the modern sci-fi genre, there was Starship Troopers, which popularized and some think generally invented the concept of soldiers dropping from orbit into a combat zone. Memes from the original film Adaptation, which I say lately, have seemingly come back from the dead. Men and women from all over the globe are joining up to fight for the future. I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part. I didn't do shit. Although I think they've always been present in the cultural zeitgeist, especially in the political climate of today. Starship Troopers The Book, written by Robert A. Heinlein, was a novel written as a response to the US cancelling nuclear testing. Heinlein has written other sci-fi novels such as Stranger in a Strange Land, Friday, and The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, just to name a few. Starship Troopers follows Juan Johnny Rico as he makes his way up the ranks in the mobile infantry of the Terran Federation. Its message basically describes how a society would work under total military control, and that veterans should be running the show instead of a traditional democracy. Huh. Sounds very similar to something else I've seen, can't put my finger on it though. Anyways, check out Knowing Better's video for a more in-depth explanation of the book. Join the mobile infantry and save the world. Service guarantees citizenship. As the movie says in the intro, however, the movie was not well received in the States, with places like the UK getting the message. Many thought it was just a cheesy action film, however, the director Paul Verhoeven states in the director's commentary that it clearly was a take and a parody of military fascism, with heavy implications to American imperialism. But I can tell you that the movie is, in fact, in our opinion, stating that war makes fascist of us all. That's true. That was the theme. Funnily enough, PewDiePie has a better video on this topic. Before Helldivers, Halo ODST and... Fortnite, I guess? There was Roughnecks, Starship Troopers Chronicles, the 1999 CG animated series set in a new, fresh take of the Starship Troopers universe. Dropping from orbit, smashing bugs, blowing things up, Tons of explosions in action. This was all little Zeno needed to be completely enthralled. Live forever, Apes. Yeah, Starship Troopers is for kids, right? Pretty sure the guys in the boardroom figured that out. Alright, this. This right here. Every school kid knows that arachnids are dangerous. I know some little kid named Timmy wants to see an entire family unit get ripped apart by arachnids. Huh? Huh? Uh... Okay. Funnily enough, the building used for production had a strict no cursing policy. If this had anything to do with why the show was aimed at younger audiences, I wouldn't know. It's still funny considering that Paul Verhoeven himself was the executive producer. Alright, get ready for a lot of names. <gasps> Main characters of the Roughneck Squad include Johnny Rico, voiced by Reno Romano, 
A familiar name to Batman fans, Dizzy Flores voiced by Elizabeth Daly, which many know as also voicing Buttercup from Powerpuff Girls, Gene Razak voiced by Jamie Haynes, but instead of Ratchak or Radshack or I don't know, it's spelled Razak. R-A-Z-A-K. It, I guess that's a better spelling than the other one. Jeff Gossard, voiced by legendary Bill Fagerbacky. Same voice as Patrick from Spongebob. Doc LaCroix, voiced by James Horan. Francis Bruto, voiced by David DeLuise. And Robert Higgins, voiced by Alexander Polinsky. Secondary characters include the pilots Carmen Ibanez and Xander Barkalo, voiced by Tish Hicks and Nicholas Guest, respectively. The private corporal, Skinny Tafai, voiced brilliantly by Steve Stanley, shows later on in the series. Oh, you think that was a lot? These voices aren't even scratching the surface of who stars in this. For example, R. Lee Ermey voices Sky Marshal Sanchez. Troopers of the Valley Forge, we must meet this threat with courage and strength, secure in the knowledge that we will emerge victorious. In the name of the Strategically Integrated Coalition of Nations. Whoops, I forgot Carl. Carl's voiced by Ryder Strong. Each character has their own distinct personality. Johnny with his gung-ho attitude similar to the film, Diz with similar traits as Dina Meyer from the film as well, but with more depth later on in the series. Carl is... well... Carl. Creepy, just get creepier. Higgins is the greeny war journalist, but becomes a helpful trooper to the squad in his own way. Doc is the medic, obviously, because his name is Doc. But he has some wonderful one-liners as well as Goss. Lieutenant's insane. Hey, we're fighting giant bugs on freaking Pluto, man. We're all insane. Both play off each other as well, and can be some great comedic relief. Bruto is the all-brawn, no-brain sergeant, and Razak plays a similar lieutenant role as the character in the film. However, he sees his squadron as his family, in a way, with no trooper left behind mentality, and not some war-torn lieutenant who sees each trooper as an expendable asset. This is for you new people. I only have one rule. Everyone fights, no one quits. If you don't do your job, I'll shoot you. Sir, um, I never had a chance to ask. Do you want to say something to the folks on Earth? And to your family? This is my family. See, there's a big difference here. The series aired on Bohot Kids Network on August 30th, 1999, and ended in April 3rd of 2000, produced by Columbia TriStar and Sony Pictures. The short runtime was due to many factors, such as the fact there were supposed to be five episodes aired a week. There wasn't even a big enough backlog to air episodes when the contract was accepted. For how tight the schedule was and how limited in time they had to make new episodes, they had to use new technology such as mocap to help in production. Sadly, it wasn't enough as they still had to rerun episodes like crazy to keep with this contract. I mean, for how much time they had, the show looks pretty well done for the time. I mean, just look at Beast Wars a reboot. Yuck. Stinky looking. And they both used the same type of early CG animated and were around the same time. Since viewers had to see reruns of episodes so many times, production was set into creating a few clip show episodes. Sadly, that also didn't go as planned. The series ended with only one season on a cliffhanger, which I'm still extremely upset about. The airtime started as early as 6am, which definitely was not a good time to start for the targeted audience. That's usually the time when school starts for most middle school students. Many people in the comments of the re-uploaded intro on YouTube say that they'll always miss the rest of it or just barely be able to see it just before being late to the bus. Box sets, DVDs, and VHS tapes allowed Roughnecks to amass a bigger following after its cancellation. I actually have a hand-me-down box set I got from my dad of all four DVDs. However, I didn't take good care of it and lost the cover sleeve and the disc box for the home front and space battle episodes. Oh, poor me. If you had only known. The series is split into eight story arcs, starting with Pluto, then the ocean world of Hydora, then onto the harsh, scorching desert planet of Tophet, the home world of the Skinnies, under the forest planet Tesca, the Zephyr Campaign, Klondalthu Campaign, Trackers, and then, finally, Homefront. Each arc takes on a similar formula, drop in, fight the bugs towards main objective, which is said to be the key to winning the bug war. 
but turns out Intel was wrong, and they have to do it all over again. I have no episode list to go off of, so I'm just gonna go arc by arc. Also, I should mention that the only footage online I could grab doesn't look so good. So if you're able to seek out the real DVDs or find actual full quality footage somewhere, I assure you it looks way better than this. Also, spoilers of course. Pluto campaign starts out just like the movie, showing a propaganda advertisement to enlist. I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part. They're doing their part. Are you? Join the mobile infantry. The only difference is that Higgins states they didn't need to enlist. Truth is, the military didn't need to advertise. Basically, everybody wanted to be a trooper after Operation Pest Control. When the mobile infantry wiped out that nasty bug infestation threatening our research stations on Pluto, enlisting was no longer just patriotic. It was cool. Assuming from this line alone, service may not be needed to gain citizenship in this universe. To all the troopers enlisting for Operation Pest Control, fighting the bugs was cool. With research outposts threatened on Pluto, the mobile infantry is called in to take care of it. After some quick introductory scenes, we see Rico reminiscing about Carmen as he sees her in the pilot seat of another ship. Too rich for your blood, my friend. Diz snaps him out of it. Earth to Rico! Earth to Rico! Come in, please. Don't, uh, sorry, did you say something? Diz then tries to show some enthusiasm to Rico, saying, Rico, our first drop! We're talking huge life moment here. You're not even a little excited? No. Think about the stories we can tell our kids. A major difference in this show is Dizzy actually doesn't get killed, unlike in the book and the film, which is an interesting take. Again, just like in the film, the squadron meets their old high school civics teacher and they prepare for a drop. Lieutenant! Oh, I don't believe it, Mr. Razak. Heads up, troopers! You will be dropped at 0800 hours. You will follow your POA. You will engage the bugs until all civilians are safely evacuated. Do you get me, roughnecks? Sir, we get you, sir! Sergeant Bruto is then introduced explaining the bugs to Higgins. Sergeant Bruto? You've seen the enemy before face to face. What can we expect? Expect ugly, like nothing you've ever seen. Give the man a mirror. The lieutenant interrupts and Higgins asks a similar question to Ray Zag. Sir? What is it, paper boy? Have we tried to negotiate with the bugs? <laughs> <laughs> the bugs can smell human blood from a kilometer away. Through skin, through suits, through steel. They feel no pain and have no emotions. Their only desire is to kill you. They are not life as we know it. Is that clear? I love here that Razak puts his amputated arm onto Higgins to show what the bugs did. It gives him a lot of backstory that the viewer can just conclude on the spot. Man, I miss when TV shows follow the show don't tell rule. The combat drop is a sick sequence that I recommend watching for yourself. It really gets you pumped up. However, I am a little bit confused as to why Pluto has an atmosphere, because there's a clear plasma trail when they re-enter. I'm also unsure why the gravity seems so high. Maybe the bugs terraformed it somehow, I have no clue. Them brain bugs been eating too much. I guess this was just to add more visual flair to the drop. Once they land on Pluto, they head towards a station. Diz has a near-miss friendly fire incident and Razak reprimands her for it. Flores! You're still making the same mistakes you did as a student. Think first, act second. Yes, sir. After coming out of the outpost, a large wave of bugs heads their way. This scene shows the might of the Marauder suits, something also taken from the original film universe, with the third movie being called Marauder. They do, however, look a lot different from the film, being less bulky and looking more or less like a power loader from the Aliens franchise. And there's also the other one that looks like an ATST from Star Wars. After a battle, the squad stirs up an unknown enemy after waiting for evac. I'm assuming this bug to be a tanker bug like the one from the film, but looking a lot more like an isopod than anything else. I really like how a lot of bugs got redesigned in this as well as added new ones. The warriors, however, are just... Oh my goodness, just Everything, don't, don't change anything about them. 
Rico, of course, goes hero mode on it, same with him in the movie, but this time he is less successful, causing the bug to fall down into a sinkhole. Lieutenant follows after him, and the squad decides to go as well. After getting out of the hole and almost having everyone killed, Rico also gets disciplined by Razak. Big time. Private! You disobeyed a direct order and almost got yourself killed. However, he calls him Gutsy, and Rico cracks a smile. Gutsy, son. This is one of the many moments where Razak starts to become Rico's mentor, and if you've seen the original movie, you know exactly what's going to happen later on. The rest of the Pluto campaign is more serialized, with a few episodes focusing on the two pilots, one focusing on transporting a baby plasma bug towards Valley Forge so they can dissect it, and also one that reveals a big plot point. The bugs were never native to Pluto, as the mobile infantry once thought. This is the closest they'll get to Earth for a while until the Homefront campaign. The reason I'm skipping a lot is so I don't cause people to not want to watch the series due to me explaining all of it, so please, I beg of you, watch this series immediately if you don't want any more spoilers. If you can't find any of the DVDs marked up on a reasonable price, they're all on YouTube, however, the quality is kind of bad. But please, PLEASE watch this series. This series needs more fans. Hydora starts out differently with a release latch on a frigate malfunctioning, so Goss, being the big tech whiz he is, decides to go out into space to unlatch it with the help of Doc. Man, these two are inseparable. Goss gets out of the thruster's way just barely in time, and there's a really cool sequence showing the squad deploying from a ship into another ship that drops jet skis. Like, that is just totally making my little kid brain just go wild right now. By the way, this was the first campaign I ever watched as a child because we only had that one singular DVD for the Hydora campaign and didn't know there was more. Until my dad got himself the whole set as his own birthday present and eventually passed it down to me. The transport bug is then shown beaching itself onto a nearby island, presumably refueling. The squad sees it and decides to move in for recon. Oh yeah, the transport bug is also very important. It was shown at the end of Pluto to show that the bugs weren't native to Pluto because they were going back and forth from space to the other planets. So yeah, sorry, I forgot to explain that. Oops! Rico, Carl, and Higgins get caught up in the mess and end up inside of the transport bug. Stuck inside a live bug! There's no telling what it might do. Lieutenant Razak, this is Private Rico. We have an emergency. Do you copy? Over. We're not getting out the way we came in. <laughs> Carl keeps claiming he's getting something because he's telepathic and can hear something supposedly talking to him from the transport bug. What is it? Carl, what happened? I don't know. I started picking up something. They escape it through its bladder and have to swim up using their built-in life vest. We're getting out of here th through its... Uh, through there? That's nasty. The message he gets is later on deciphered by him, and he keeps the information to himself until he has an opportunity to speak to Razak. Surveillance uncovered no evidence that Hydora is the bug's home planet. It appeared the transport stopped to offload enemy troops and refuel. Nothing further to report. Alpha team out. There is one more thing, Lieutenant. When we were inside the transport, I received a message from the bugs. I thought it was jumbled. I don't know where it came from, but it was strong. The sender wanted me to deliver it. And? The bugs want us to know that they won't stop until the entire human race is exterminated. Duh! A bit odd that the bug strategy here is to tell Carl directly that they're going to eradicate the species. You'd think they wouldn't want to tell them to not jeopardize their plans, but oh well. These are the villains of the show. It must have been a move on the bugs to demoralize them. A moment later, Carl is hit by a Rippler spike and his suit begins to crush him. For some reason, the Rippler spikes have some kind of chemical reactions in them to make the suit start crumpling. So as they're chased by Ripplers, Doc tries to help Carl stabilize his vitals. They get chased into a cove which pulls them under a whirlpool into a Rippler queen nest. 
This is where Razak rendezvous with them and takes hold of Carl. They blow up the nest along with the queen and return Carl and the whole squad back to the Valley Forge. I'm gonna go forward a bit more into this arc because it finally shows the elusive presence of the brain bug. This is presumably the same thing that was trying to talk to Carl in the transport. In this series, the brain bugs are a bigger threat to humanity being living information centers by eating soldiers' brains. But also since they have gained so much information from doing so, they also have telepathic abilities. I mean, I guess that works in a weird Cthulhu-esque way, although being completely scientifically impossible, but it's cool. Carl keeps getting attacked by a bug with psychic attacks on the Valley Forge. The mobile infantry discharges him due to them thinking it's just a mental problem, but Carl urges the crew to let him fight because he can sense the roughnecks are in danger. Carl joins in the fight at the last moment and blows up the brain bug with his mind. And this is where Hydora ends, showing the bugs in complete disarray without the brain bugs control. This makes me think the arachnids have more in common with the Covenant from Halo, as they have farmed or recruited different races of bugs around the universe to do their bidding. This arc starts with Carl and Bruto having a scuffle for a moment before dropping into Tophet's atmosphere. What's going on here, Sergeant? Just testing the power suits for structural integrity, sir. Then Higgins rockets don't fire and he makes this funny scream. Diz saves him though. Thanks, Diz. No problem. After searching around for what seems like hours in the hot sun, they come upon a town that looks like it's made out of giant gourds. This is revealed to be the Skinny's home planet, a race of aliens that were actually in the book who sided with the bugs. Hmm. I wonder if they'll be friendly. Doc, of course, tries to scan them, being the medical weirdo, and immediately gets kicked away. They decide to follow the skinnies around to their leader in a strange looking building while having skinnies menacingly follow them. Goss tries out a new invention he made called the talk box and puts it onto the skinny in the chair. Sir, my talk box, with some modifications. Do it. Right. Be gentle. Can it understand me? Yes. Then it starts to understand saying his name is Colonel Tafai. Said the parent. I'm Lieutenant Razak of the Strategically Integrated Coalition of Nations. I am Colonel Tafai. Why are you here, Razak? We hope to establish a base of operations on your planet to help us fight the bug. He explains to the troopers that there are no bugs present because they couldn't adjust to their harsh atmosphere. Hmm... Rico sees through this lie pretty quickly. It's kind of nice to meet another species that's not trying to off you all the time. If all the bugs died from exposure to Toffet's atmosphere, where are all the corpses? They're then led into a trap. Oh, what a surprise! With the bugs underneath the whole time. The skinnies fire at them and they have to evacuate out of the area, and Bruder does a funny Terminator reference. Jeez, Brodo, calm down. They're already on fire and exploding. You don't have to shoot at them. Day 19. A momentary lull in the battle against the bugs and skinnies for control of Tophet. Both had turned out to be a lot tougher than Psycon anticipated. Troopers were trained to be fearless, but the truth was that every trooper feared something. Maybe it was staring into the cold black eyes of an attacking bug, or 
being crushed inside a power suit by a skinny constrictor blast. For one trooper, it was the quiet. The next segment of the arc shows Higgins trying to make a documentary piece on the lieutenant. Dispatch number 137B. <clears throat> okay. This is FedNet correspondent Robert Higgins reporting. As I continue to cover the war from the front lines, I find myself on Tophet, a torrid planet in the binary system of Renara 7. The enemy were well dug in when I dropped to the surface with the first MI troops, Razak's Roughnecks. Sergeant Bruto, Doc LaCroix, Dizzy Flores, Jeff Gossard, Johnny Rico, Carl Jenkins, and of course, the subject of this piece, Lieutenant Gene Razak, an aloof study in quiet courage. <laughs> Boy, this piece is gonna win me the Merle Award. Razak asks him to try to fly a skimmer, and in the skimmer, the most based line comes out of Razak's mouth. Sir, According to High Command, there hasn't been any bug activity in this sector for over a week. Keep your eyes on the road, Private. Y yes, sir. Well, I guess I was just wondering if you knew something that High Command didn't. You ask a lot of questions, Higgins. I'm, I'm a journalist, sir. That's too bad I don't talk to journalists. Only troopers. Higgins then somehow maneuvers his way out of the weird flame trench, but then they spot a huge wave of blister bugs. This is a new variant of the warrior bug, which can spit acid. Razak calls in the fleet with Commander Marlow and Barkalo, suggesting using antimatter missiles. We have a hot zone down here, Commander. Bug activity, battalion strength. If they make it to the Montavi mountain range, dig in, we'll never get them out. Copy, Alpha Leader. Your recommendations? A conventional air attack will only scatter them. Antimatter missiles. Take all the bugs at once. Efficient, non-radioactive. My thoughts exactly. Make it happen. It'll take a few hours to work up the attack sequence, prep the ships and the payloads. We'll take it from here, Lieutenant. Better clear out of there. We're gonna light up that sector like the 4th of July. I like how Marlow here says he's gonna light the sector up like 4th of July, which suggests Sycon or at least the United States still celebrates their independence. Oh well, that didn't last very long. But I guess they can still reminisce on the past. Higginson travels through the same flame trench like an idiot and the skimmer crashes. The rest of the team hears their last transmission and agrees to go find them after Brain Boy, as Bruto calls Carl, says they're alive. He can feel them. They're alive. I can feel it. You better be right, Brain Boy. With Razak and Higgins inside of the airstrike zone, he suggests they won't call in an evac team. Razak gives Higgins a gun and they head north. Heart of bug country. Then there's this nice scene here where Bruto pumps up the team to go rescue them. Really shows even he cares about his own squad members. Listen up, apes! We have two hours, 47 minutes for retrieval. Those antimatter missiles are gonna be vaporizing everything within the Mito sector. What are you waiting for? A goodbye kiss? Saddle up! Although, into their excursion, their skimmer gets shot down by skinnies. Razak and Higgins are attacked by bugs near an acid river. Razak blows up a warrior into the river to use it as a raft until the bug dissolves. Razak's hand gets damaged, leading to Higgins asking about how he lost it. This then leads into one of the greatest character moments of the series. I'll just let this play out. Chemistry 101, Private. The high alkaline content in the soil neutralizes the acid. Lieutenant, how did you lose your arm? My first solo command during Operation Pest Control. My orders were to move my squad through a valley and secure the hill on the other side. Simple up. After all, the valley was quiet. feel it sometimes. Phantom limb syndrome. Guess some pain is never meant to go away. If you notice, Higgins was recording this story, and later, once they are rescued and he's working on it, you can see him deleting the whole project out of respect for him. 
In the bug war, individual achievements didn't really mean much. Troopers lived and died as a team. But some battles couldn't help but be personal. And they were meant to stay that way. Next section is about the team having to deal with a robotic squad member that is assigned to their squad. The robot starts to be a bit of a nuisance to the team with Razak having his orders questioned and insulting Higgins. Your decision is ill-advised, Lieutenant. My power supply, motor reflexes, optical and auditory sensors are all far superior to any human. I am not in the habit of having my orders questioned by anyone or anything. Now fall back and take up the rear. Private Higgins, your lack of training is impeding the squad's progress. Thanks for the encouragement. Then an earthquake happens, causing Higgins to fall, but the robot saves him. Rico then tells Higgins he would have had to push that thing down. It's only a machine. It saved my life, Rico. Self-preservation. You would have knocked the thing off the cliff. It's a machine, not a trooper. How I think about the automatons, Rico. Based. Never forget the creek. Higgins names him Chaz, the robot's acronym standing for Cybernetic Humanoid Assault System. Higgins slowly gets to know him as a trooper and not just a machine. Chaz is voiced by Ed Hopkins, and I found out that he does additional voices for characters in StarCraft. Very fitting. Oh yeah, there's also a Terminator reference in this as well with Chaz coming out of a wall of fire. Not bad for a tin can. After this scene though, Carl gets hit with a constrictor blast. Chaz is ordered to retrieve Carl to safety, but declines and instead goes to the sniper tower itself, literally punching the skinny out of it. Rico then reprimands it. Rule number one, troopers take care of their own. I violated no regulations. Regulations? We're talking about a trooper's life. Tell them. Later on, Chaz tries to project an acceptable loss scenario for a battle going on, but Higgins lectures him on this issue. Intel says the bug to trooper ratio in the past could be as high as 10 to 1. Lieutenant Razor, I will analyze the situation and project an acceptable casualty rate. Acceptable to who? Chaz, a trooper is not a statistic. Losses are never acceptable. Later on, Higgins gets stuck on a mine with bugs on approach. Of course, after hearing no losses are acceptable, Chaz covers the retreat and sacrifices himself by throwing Higgins off the mine. Whoa! Do not move! I'll get No, I will. Defuse it. Negative. The trigger is pressure sensitive. Without weight displacement, the mine will detonate. Get out of here, or we're both dead. I was never alive. That line still goes so hard, man. You're right, Private Higgins. Some losses are not acceptable. <laughs> This is one of those one-off characters you remember for the rest of the show with how much character is just put into him by being around the squad and learning for himself. It's a shame we don't get anything else of him later on in the series. However, this does kind of set up a major character that appears in the next arc in a sort of weird way. Fast forward to the part in the arc where the squad is taken hostage by skinnies. The squad actually puts up quite a fight before being completely overcome. Oh, would you look at that? Concussion rifles. Man, these skinnies were 11 years ahead of the curve. And no, I'm not just making a meme because the blast looks pink. Goss literally says that the rifle's disabled by concussion, not shrapnel. What were those explosives the skinnies tossed at us? They disabled by concussion, not shrapnel. 
Skinny's wanted us breathing. I wonder if the developers for Halo Reach watched this and gained some inspiration. Once in the Skinny prison, Carl starts having a mental breakdown and shouting, The mind is their master. The mind is their master, and the mastermind is coming. Somebody shut off the high fi I'm trying to think. First time for everything. The mind is their master. I said the zip it, private. Which can only mean one thing. The brain bug appears and takes hostage of Bruto and Carl, Carl telling Bruto to fight it. Help me. Look at me. You can fight it. Focus. 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 He overcomes the brain bug's paralysis by focusing. They fight back while the rest of the team agrees to go back and rescue them with 10 minutes of reserve power in their suits. They use their batteries as non-conventional explosives to open their prison door. Once they are all rescued at the nick of time, there's this funny scene with Carl and Bruto. Hey Sarge, after spending a little time together, are you and Jenkins best buds now? I'll take that as a no. In a later portion of the arc, after being pinned down by blaster bugs, not blister bugs, even though they look the same but shoot giant waves of fire, the heat is hot enough to make the sand turn to glass around them. You turn the sand to glass? It's as slick as ice. Rico does escape three and kills them. After walking around, Carl states he feels something below their feet, and turns out it's none other than Colonel Tafai, the same skinny they made first contact with in the beginning. They start interrogating him in the next few scenes, and turns out he was being controlled by a control bug. Carl finds this out by reading his mind, claiming there's more than one voice in there he can hear. These same types of bugs appear in the Starship Troopers sequel, Heroes of the Federation, but it didn't come out until 2004. Definitely some inspiration from this show going on. I mean, come on, they even kinda look similar, and attached to people's spines. Huh. Wonder if that's what that thing was that attached itself to Amir. The bugs did it! While trying to escape Tafai in his bug-controlled state, Carl's attacked by a control bug as well. He blows it up with his mind, of course. And then he uses so much power that he basically makes himself brain dead. He unfortunately does not make another in-person appearance until Klondathu. Tafai, after having his bug removed, then states that there is a transport refueling from skinny slave miners. They mine for a specific substance on their planet called Xylon, which Goss states is highly fissionable and can be used as fuel in starships. So, they find the mine, the transport, and Rico and Diz disable it, ending the slavery of the skinnies on Tophet. Higgins ends with this narration. The battle for Tophet was winding down. Just a few mop-up missions and the troopers would be on their collective way. We had saved a troubled planet and lost a good friend. Alright, so I'll admit it, I did a bit of a goof. I did find some relatively better looking footage for the show on Internet Archive, so from now on I will be using the files I attained from there. That's on me, my apologies, for you having to sit through more than 30 minutes of blurry 360p. This arc shows another propaganda advertisement. Psycon announces that the skinnies have joined forces with the humans and are going to aid in the bug war. The rumors are true. The skinnies have joined the war effort. Our former foes are now G.I. Joes, and our pan-galactic cause has never seemed more worthy or attainable. Psycon drill instructors are working double time to teach these tall dogs new tricks. Sure, they don't breathe oxygen, but they still put their bravery on one leg at a time. And that means victory is just around the corner. The next scene shows Razak being a simp to his dominant e-girl in video chat. Hello, Gene. General Redwing. But he notices in his briefing that there is a particular skinny that was assigned to them. With Carl being out of action, a new squad member is then introduced. It's Colonel Tafai another non-human squad member. Now that he is enlisted into the mobile infantry, he is now demoted to private. The team notices this and starts to have big issues with him in their squad, Razak included. Carl was forced out of action due to the very same bug that attached itself to Defy, many seeing him at fault for the reason Carl is gone. Once they are on the planet of Tesca, a skirmish breaks out causing them to crash into the ocean. On this particular mission, they are to advance and secure a piece of land named Zagama Beach. Yep, it's the very same Zegama Beach that is referenced from the original movie. Tesca is, again, rumored to be the bug's home planet, and the invasion operation is set in motion. 
from what Higgins says, Tesca Nemorosa, the only worthwhile real estate in the entire system. A moon as big as the Earth, orbiting around the gas giant Tesca 4. Psycon had determined that this lush jungle planetoid was the breadbasket for the entire bug empire. All we had to do was take the thing and cut the bugs off from their food supply. Once on the seabed, Razek orders Tafai to scout ahead, alone. Private Tafai, scout the beach for cover. Yes, sir. Any backup, sir? No. He then clears the area, allowing them to advance ahead. By the way, there is just some blatant racism towards this skinny in this episode, and it's just hard not to laugh. Oh boy, I'm a horrible person. Once they make it up the bug mound, Tafai starts making weird bird noises. Oh! He's not an ape, he's alone. I'm out of here. The squad didn't know there were Ripplers at the top ready to strike. Tafai then helps them neutralize them. They then take out the mound. Afterwards, there's this really nice scene with all the troopers taking their helmets off to breathe the oxygen atmosphere. Ah, oh, sweet. You know, this is the first breath of non-recycled air I've had since we left Earth. I think this is what I was fighting for. But then Rico steps in and ruins the moment. Glad you're the one we got. If you think for one moment anything you've done today comes close to making up for the damage you Rico, did on top Rico, he just saved our butts. Can't ask for more than that. I can. I can ask for him to be as good as the man he cost us. As good a friend and as good a human being. Oh, I look at him being a little whiny baby on the rock. Next episode shows the squad advancing ahead into the jungle. There's a heartfelt moment here where Bruto and Tafai talk about their loved ones back home. Is that your family? Luar, my mate. Our children, Tafal and Emret. They're back on Tophet? The children are with my clan there, yes. And your wife? My wife is a soldier. She has been missing for some time. I'm sorry. Oops. Jeez, Rico, you're a jerk. You jerk! Don't you see we've all lost someone? That skinny is the reason I lost Kara. That's all I see. My boy 17, all-star fullback. Sarge is a breeder. Bad news for the gene pool. <laughs> Shut up, meatballs. Max is tougher than all you apes put together. If he was with me, we could clear this planet by morning. The whole galaxy. Family hour's over. Then once they stop their break, every trooper is picked off one by one by giant spider bugs, a newer variant of bug. Only Rico and Tafai are left and have to settle their differences. Tafai, being from a scorching desert planet, starts getting hypothermia. His temperature control unit was destroyed while the spider grabbed his. Look out! I like how you can actually see the suit sparking after the bug hits it. Tafai starts crying for his wife, being in delirious state, which me watching this again made me feel extremely bad for him. Then he's awakened by Rico, being a complete racist. This was his way of waking him up, although I think this is also a way of him just letting out all his anger. I don't have time for this. Azred, Luar, Azred. Luar. Luar. Cry to your wife later. I'm sick of hearing about her. Besides, with your track record, you're probably the reason she's missing in the first place. And that's assuming she didn't ditch your skinny butt for someone who can actually fight! You couldn't protect her when she needed you most. With a father like you, it's a miracle your kids weren't taken too. I will destroy you, human! That's the colonel I remember. You sought to anger me. Why? I sought to wake you up. My condition is unchanged, but I am awake. Good, because I think it's time for plan B. Rico's idea to get Tafai's vital back into shape is to get the spider bug to wrap him up in its webs to warm him up again. Rico also puts a tracker on the cocoon, allowing Rico to follow it and find the rest of his squad. They are then opened up and Goss repairs Tafai's unit. After Rico getting to know Tafai through this episode, Bruto asks him a question. Don't you two hate each other? Takes too much effort. 
it was finally unanimous. Tafai was an ape. Poor guy. I feel like Chaz, the robot in the previous arc, sort of set this up in motion of the squad. Him also being another non-human in the ranks, the short development of his character probably had an effect on the troopers' ability to gain their respect for Tafai very quickly. This episode also sets up the bond that forms between Bruto and Tafai. Next episode starts with an ambush on routine patrol. Goss gets his eye scratched, therefore he is unusable as a pilot. Hold still, Goss. How is he? Just a scratch. But it is his eye, so I'd rather not take any chances. Gossard! How many fingers am I holding up? I'm not usually checking out your fingers. Alright, back to base. After returning to base at Zegama Beach, Rico is then assigned to be the temporary Marauder pilot. Their next mission is to hunt down a supposed brain bug in the area. They get there, and turns out to be something way worse. Bioengineered bug weapons. All this time we thought the older generation wanted to eat us. They were actually planning to feed us to the youth set. Huh, that's the least of it. I'm betting that fluid is raw genetic material harvested from the indigenous life forms and mixed with some powerful mutagen generated by those nurser bugs. In English? We're seeing millions of years of random evolution compressed into minutes. Why terraform planets when they can re-engineer themselves to fit the worlds they want to conquer? and breed more dangerous subspecies as living weapons for their war machine. That's why they were more interested in the seal sharks than us. I'm betting we're still next in line for the Cuisinart. We can't let any of these species, mutated or otherwise, survive. This explains how the spider bugs appeared so quickly. Once an airstrike is called in, Rico falls down a hole. Typical Rico. He then finds his way out of the bug caves and reaches the surface. The roughnecks then plan to return and rescue him. Roughnecks never leave a trooper behind, after all. Unfortunately for Rico, he is bitten by a spider bug, and look, blood, in a kid's show. TV really was braver back then. The poison then courses through his veins, making him weak. He then starts to have visions of his past. This episode is one of my favorites for this exact reason. The flashbacks take a twist on the original movie's portrayal of Rico's training, enlistment, and high school years. Who can tell me the difference between a citizen and a civilian? You. Why are only citizens allowed to vote? It's a reward. What the Federation gives you for doing federal service. No. No. Something given has no value. Flores. Citizens can vote. Civilians can't. Of course, but why? Ibanez. A citizen has earned the right to vote by putting her or his life on the line to defend the peace. That's a textbook response, Ibanez. You're dreaming, bro. But what do these words mean? Rico. Uh, uh... People who forget that always pay. Rico, what's the moral difference, if any, between a civilian and a citizen? A citizen accepts personal responsibility for the safety of the body politic, defending it with his life. A civilian does not. The exact words of the text. Rico, in the mobile infantry, we had a word for guys like you. Washout. Jenkins, help him. Citizens, civilians, the difference? A citizen knows how to live with the choices he makes, or how to die defending them. You just may graduate after all. Lancey Brown even returns to reprise his role as Sergeant Zim. Ten, ha! I am Career Sergeant Zim, your senior drill instructor. And you are the sorriest bunch of would-be recruits I have ever had the misfortune laying eyes upon! To think, think this, this had, had to happen, happen to me. me! Suck in that gut! You think you're infantry! You think you're apes! Feet together! You don't rank as scum in my book! Eyes front! As far as I'm concerned, you are all washouts until and unless you prove otherwise! And most of you will not prove otherwise! Move! Anytime you think I'm being too tough! Anytime you think I'm being unfair! Anytime you miss your mommy, quit! You son from 1248, you grab your gear, you take a stroll down washout lane! Do you get me? Sir, yes, sir! Fanny, I wonder if there's a handful of guts in a whole bunch of you. Once at the nick of time, in typical Roughnecks fashion, Rico is then rescued. However, he is in a coma. He is put in a healing tank reminiscent of the same tank Rico is put in the 1997 movie. 
Then, disaster strikes. A large monsoon approaches the beach, capable of wiping out and flooding the whole area, meaning Rico could be next. Of course, they rescue him by moving his pod into the Zephyr using his power, but just barely after the storm subsides, Rico's power goes out. Doc says he's on his own. And then Rico wakes up. Let's get out of here. Next episode is Rico making his way towards recovery, however he can hear things and is having nightmares. This leads to the doctor wanting to section aid him. This is a military term used to provide those unfit or mentally unwell to continue service. This comes from World War II Army regulation in the United States. Rico then sees visions of control bugs nearing Zegama, and of course, they show up right in the middle of the doctor about to discharge him. Rico breaks himself out of the tank and kills all the bugs via an alcohol-fueled explosion. Rico then does the funny with Carmen, and this ends up with Barcolo. This is due to a scene before where she feels like Rico is missing from her life, so she tries to get with Goss and is rejected. And in the same scene, she sees Barcolo playing a game of volleyball. He invites her over, and once they win, she rewards him with a kiss. This is one of the other things that has a better twist on it from the original films. The love triangle is way more fleshed out and leads to some important elements of the story. Thus ending the Space Vietnam arc. No, not that one. Stay put and sit tight. Victory appears imminent. Military officials insist the bug is no match for the fighting men and women of the Psycon forces. Uncover your potential. Live the adventure. Join the mobile infantry today. Based on the film by Paul Verhoeven and the book by Robert A. Heinlein, Roughnecks is a 3D animated adventure the likes of which you've never seen. Our heroes, Razak's Roughnecks, are a rough and tumble group of teenagers who find themselves hurled into the first interstellar war that threatens to ruin their beloved planet, Terry. Roughnecks. The Zephyr arc is my favorite of the series. The squad, after a routine off-camera mission that nearly took the squad's lives, are then called in for another mission to locate and retrieve a chemical used for a new anti-bug weapon. The bioweapon relies on a substance called Toxin B3. It's a second generation mutation of Toxin B3. It attacks a bug from the inside out with fairly consistent results. Guess bugs don't like steak. Another research vessel, called the Sequoia, is going to the same asteroid thought to have elevated levels of B3. The Roughnecks are dispatched to go there to give them protection, just in case. Xander and Carmen pilot the ship towards the supposed asteroid, however Xander has a problem with what looks like fireflies bursting out of the back of his neck, causing the Zephyr to crash into the asteroid. These bugs are never shown why or how they got there, but it's implied that he got bitten by them on the last mission that was off camera. Come on, baby. Minor damage to exterior systems, nothing irreparable. But the recycling unit's not in great shape and our fuel cell's history. Which means we're going nowhere on our own. Let's raise the Sequoia and let them know where things stand. Uh, that's the bad news. Comlink's down, way down. Local communications are marginal. Long range, maybe we can receive, but we won't be transmitting. With communications down and fuel cells damaged, the crew needs to MacGyver their way out of the sticky situation. Carmen says it's a small asteroid and... Well, it's a small asteroid. Even a pack of lab rats should be able to find it. What kind of dumb logic is that, Carmen? Do you not see the millions of other asteroids out in the belt before crashing here? 
Oh well. The squad then walks around outside to try and locate the Sequoia. While they're out for recon, Diz and Goss stays in the Zephyr to rummage through supplies. She takes care of Xander as well to continue the character development from the last arc. Xander, you're looking good. Diz, you have to check the thruster assemblies. There might be leakage. Shh, shh, Xander, you need to rest. Thank you, Diz. Hey, you're the hero. No, he isn't. He literally crashed the ship. Anyway, Razek and Doc fall into a cave where they find weird leeches. In the scene where they try to escape from them, Doc is dogpiled by them. He suggests to sacrifice his life as well as Razek's to remove them, but Razek has other ideas. There's also this weird looking scene that shows Razak's face in fear, but I don't think it was rendered all the way. His face looks like Play-Doh. Meanwhile, Bruto and Tafais brought large fire-breathing bugs. Three sunsets in two hours and I get stuck watching them with a seven-foot alien. Then for you too, the sunset is considered... romantic. Don't get any ideas. Something moving down there. The Sequoia crew? Could be, but I'm not quite ready to give a friendly wave. Red Leader, this is Green Team. Come in. Over. Green Team, this is Red Leader. No sign of the Sequoia, but this rock ain't dead. We got bugs or something. Big ones. How many? Twenty, man. Don't move. Wait for backup before you move in. Repeat orders. Over. Don't. Wait. Move in. Red Leader. Red Leader, come in. I'm losing you. Red Leader. We're going in for a closer look. Is that wise? Lieutenant's orders, I think. Carmen and Rico then get trapped in an avalanche. This is where Rico and Carmen share some intimate moments, separate from the rest of the squad. Bruto and Tafai fight the giant firebugs, and this funny line is said. How much ammo do you have? Ten rounds. There's too many of them. We're gonna have to hotfoot it. We will die. Mr. Negativity! Once Diz rescues both Carmen and Rico, she immediately gets jealous. I saw the way you and Carmen acted together. What are you talking about? We've just been buried by an avalanche for six hours. And doing what to pass the time, I wonder? Alright, Miss Kissed Xander on the beach, girl. Once the team is all secured in the Zephyr, Doc suggests they look for B3 to keep the team focused, as it's the very thing they came for, even though there's no sign of the Sequoia. Sir, if, as we believe, the reason the Sequoia is not finding Toxin B3 is because they're there and not here, shouldn't we be collecting samples? Sooner or later, the bugs will be back. I know it's risky, but it'll keep the team focused. Listen up, apes. Off your cans. They also realize, oh well, they've landed on the wrong asteroid. Who would have guessed? The communications relay is only able to receive, so they intercept a message from the Sequoia. What's your situation, Major? Could be better, Commander. No sign of the Toxin B3 we're here to collect, and no word from our support team. Then there's no point in staying. Well, sir, we could hang on another 24 hours in case the Zephyr makes contact. Negative, Major. One squad is MIA already. Return to the Valley Forge at once. Yes, sir. <sighs> we could hang on for another 24 hours. Poor babies. When you pick the wrong asteroid, Barkalo, you really pick the wrong asteroid. Lay off, Sarge. I'd rather be on the wrong asteroid in one piece than on the right one in scattered chunks. They look like they're playing volleyball on a tropical beach, which I have no idea how a tropical beach can be on an asteroid, but oh well, there's brain-eating bugs in this, so I can't even complain. The scientists were supposed to be collecting a bug poison, and we were supposed to be providing protection. Instead, we were doing the collecting, and praying the Sequoia would come and protect us. If we do find B3, how much are we supposed to gather? A hundred kilos. Depending on its density, that could mean one canister or fifty. If I may, Lieutenant, why are we bothering? A ton of the toxin won't do anybody any good if we die here with it. Then we'll just have to stay alive, won't we, Rico? Goss, after talking to Higgins, mentions to him that there may be Argonite on the large ice spires. Higgins goes out to investigate, Diz tagging along. The rock will be used to help boost the Zephyr's signal. Argonite is a natural superconductor, according to Goss. I've done some quick research and turns out it isn't a superconductor at all, and probably doesn't even exist. 
I do see some pages about aragonite though, so I'm unsure if this is just a typo or just a made-up mineral. I'm fairly sure it's the latter because it's impossible for just a rock to be what we thought LK99 was supposed to be. Too bad it wasn't. I love fusion reactors. Once Higgins finds the Argonite, he's ambushed by what the squad now calls Fire Fries. This saves him, of course, once again. Don't you stand there? Move it! Meanwhile, Razak and the rest of the squad are looking for B3 in a cave. Turns out the leeches are the source of it. There's your B3. The leeches? Or something they ate. Might as well stock up while we're here. While trying to escape the cave, a blizzard blows Carmen out of the cave into space. She's presumed dead by Doc because he claims the gravity is so low that she was blown away. Rico keeps believing she's alive somewhere. And what do you know? The asteroid is alive. Carmen gets attacked by some weird tentacle coming out and grabbing her. I'm avoiding an obvious joke here. Once they all assess the situation in the Zephyr, Carmen magically reappears somehow. Huh. Avoiding obvious joke again. They're all excited to see her. Rico hugs her but doesn't get anything back. Man, I feel you, dude. Suddenly the Sequoia sends a message responding to the distress call. The makeshift communications relay with the Argonite worked. Rico sees Diz hugging Xander and goes into his cabin to sulk. In the next episode, the Sequoia lets them know they're on their way to pick them up. They crash due to the asteroid shifting its position. No signal is found. Razak suggests they go and find the crew, if they survived. However, if they weren't, they could use the spare fuel cell to escape. While they walk to the crash site, a bug eye stalk comes out of the ground and stares at them without them noticing. It gives me chills down my spine to this day. Somewhat reminiscent of the scene from Star Wars with the giant asteroid worm. Razak says both teams are going the wrong way, so Higgins and Xander go to the crash site instead. When they both get there, Higgins films Xander entering the derelict ship, but he's grabbed by a fire fry. There wasn't time! Forget it. Let's move. After everyone reconvenes at the Zephyr, they all go to the crash site to retrieve Xander. They find him in a room with a ton of dead bugs. Xander then starts to act bizarre and creepy. Nicholas Guest really nails the performance. Major, where's the crew? I killed them all. Fries, nice work. Everything's gonna be okay now, Xander. Rizek finds the crew's dog tags and presumes they all got burnt up by the fries. I have a pretty good idea. Permission to be spooked, sir. Later, Higgins. And I'll join you. Once they get out of the sequoia, they are chased down by a horde of fries. They almost fall down a ledge and have to tightrope over it. Xander starts walking towards them creepily as if something is controlling him. Diz tries to get him out of the situation as the rest make their way over. Goss drops the fuel cell down the chasm and Goss swings over the rope to retrieve it. Once the Roughnecks meet back at the Zephyr, the horde of fries continue to chase them. They all get into the turrets at the Zephyr to try and hold them off while Goss puts in the new fuel cell. With the new fuel cell in, Carmen attempts to fly out. They seem to get out scot-free, but a Firefry got in somehow and tries to attack Xander. But what the bug can see is not... human. Somehow this causes the fry to explode, causing the Zephyr to crash again, back right where they started. We hit hard, right back where we started. But at least we'd fallen as far as we could fall. Or so we thought. Next episode shows the crew assessing the situation once again, but Xander has been brought to the brink of madness. He watches himself getting captured over and over again. Dizzy gets annoyed by this and Doc gives him a sleeping tranquilizer. We're worrisome, but the changes inside were downright terrifying. Xander's temporary capture by the Firefries had sent him over the edge, and the rest of us weren't far behind. Ammo was low, morale was lower. Sorry, pal, but you're driving me up a tree. Try to get some sleep, why don't you? Dizzy's right, Xander. You need to rest. Doctor's orders. The Sequoia's fuel cell that they've borrowed is now shot. They only have enough fuel to raise off the ground. With weeks of waiting time for the Valley Forge to rescue them, they have no other options. Suddenly, the ground starts shaking. The asteroid, or rather, thing, seems to be waking up. With all the commotion, a horde of fries is stirred up. They are all heading straight for the Zephyr. 
The crew has no options but to fight it out and keep the fries out of range of the ship. Something snaps in Xander while this is all happening. Goss tries to rig a gas barrier using the bug poison around the ship while Diz, Defy, and Rico try to distract the bugs away. The gas is unleashed, destroying the horde. However, now there are more coming. Barkolo moves towards the horde. Then it looks as if he's controlling them to move away. Then he falls into a giant hole. Man, what is up with people in this show falling into holes? I only turned my back for a minute. At least he took the fries with him. There's not a bug in sight. Xander knew the risks. He was a roughneck. He was a hero! I'll tell you what he was. He was the lucky one. Lucky? He took the easy way out. We get to sit here and wonder if we're gonna freeze or be roasted by Xander's pals. Higgins starts the goodbye messages for everyone in case they don't make it out. This is why this is my favorite arc. Seems like there's overwhelming odds and complete uncertainty, then the somberness and sorrow of the crew wondering if they'll make it out or not really punctuates it. Um, aren't you gonna tape a message, Lieutenant? The people I care about are all right here. LT! Fry's coming in! Now there is another Fry swarm approaching. With nothing else to lose, they decide to die fighting. In the chaos of preparing, Rico has made Corporal in case Razek and Brutal go down. What could be more important than this? You made Corporal! Congratulations! What's that supposed to mean? It means, should anything happen to me and Bruto, you're in charge. Hey, hey, you are coming back, sir! Don't start giving me orders, Corporal. Practice on someone else! Don't even think about it. Then there's this awesome last stand and sorrowful background music to boot, easily in the top 10 best scenes of the show. Remember the Roughnecks. The best Earth had to offer. On my order! I do not like these odds. Live forever, Apes. Oh! Fire! Once they're cornered by the Fries, the asteroid starts having more seismic activity. The Zephyr falls into a giant pit. Carmen tries to stabilize it with the thrusters. They land in a large area with green liquid. It's immediately obvious that they are now in the asteroid bug's stomach. They soon realize they're running out of oxygen, and fast. Roto and Doc man the marauders to get into the green pool to check out what's going on and perhaps find an oxygen source. Once walking around, they find an oxygen supply in an area with weird red floating mass. This is probably the giant bug's blood. Meanwhile, the green stuff starts eating through the Zephyr's bottom hole. They have to find a way to fix it. Doc and Bruto also figure out they're not in a cave at all and are inside a giant living organism. Doc also sees the symbiosis the Firefries have with the giant bug. Turns out the leeches are like white blood cells trying to fight off infection. Doc and Bruto are attacked by a swarm of fries and they see Xander emerge from them. Meanwhile, more fries start burning their way through the Zephyr as well. Their oxygen supply is nearly toast while they're being overwhelmed with bugs. Xander returns to the Zephyr, saying the bugs understand him, and he laughs maniacally. You disobeyed an order. What happened, Barkalo? I don't know, but the bugs... They understood me. Ah, we found air! We just have to go back for it. I have a theory about this little asteroid of ours. I think it's alive. <laughs> Next episode, the crew is now running out of air. The team needs to find the source of the oxygen they found earlier. Bruto and Rico get separated from Doc and Diz. Bruto falls down into more of that green stuff and has leeches all over him. Rico gets him out though and drops him off with the rest of the squad and tells Razak the situation. Higgins and Rico then go to find Doc and Diz, who just found a huge source of O2. 
Diz and Doc get sucked into an artery before they can rendezvous back with the rest of the team. The orifice that closed them off open back up, allowing them to follow. Higgins starts to run out of oxygen and starts rambling funny nonsense. This makes him say the best lines of his in the entire show. Ah, we can't have passed him in the tunnel. Who knows? <laughs> People go places. What's the matter with you? Nothing. I think I'm a little short on O2 is all. To get you back. Ah, I don't want to go back to the ship. Everybody's going to be grouchy. I'll tell you what. I'll stay right here. You find Doc and Diz. Then we can all go back to my place. <laughs> Higgins is left with a compressor, knowing that they will probably have clean air soon. Goss then overhears Xander screaming about the fries, saying they were born to burn. Born to burn? This gives him an idea to use them as a fuel source. Razek then goes in to find his MIAs, which leads to Razek finding Higgins completely delirious. She'll be coming around the mountain when she comes. She'll be coming around the mountain. She'll be coming around the. <laughs> She'll be coming around the mountain when she comes. <laughs> Why, if it isn't Lieutenant Razak? <laughs> Say, LT, have you met Irene? <laughs> Say hi, Irene. You're breathing oxygen now, sport, so you can quit acting like an imbecile. Where's Rico? Oh, I remember him. <laughs> Goss says they have 30 minutes left before the fries overcharge the engines and blow up, so the lieutenant and the rest are gonna have to hurry it up. Rico eventually finds Doc and Diz covered in leeches, but burns them off. Razak is also there. Ibana starts the launch sequence, but something is wrong. Xander tries to sabotage their escape. He activates the auto-destruct on the Zephyr, which has no abort code. Tafai jettisons the explosive payload as a manual override into the acid and Xander is taken care of. Everyone else then gets aboard just in time for Ibanas to engage the thrusters to escape. The full scale of the bug here is shown, insanely massive with a giant gaping maw trying to eat them. Turns out this is a species of bug called an ice bug, which destroy whole planets once they are awakened. This ice bug happened to be on a collision course towards Earth. Thankfully, the auto-destruct payload inside its stomach blows it to pieces. This arc is easily my favorite because of the fact it's not just a regular routine mission of fighting bugs. It's a different formula entirely. The crew has to face overwhelming odds in dire situations, but they all stick together and figure it out. This is just pure essence of Roughnecks in this arc. I have no idea how many times I've rewatched this arc when I was little. It was just so cool to me to have a space mission inside of a giant living alien. Now they call them ice bugs. And they sleep for thousands, maybe millions of years until a chance encounter brings them fuel for an interstellar journey of unimaginable devastation. Ice bugs destroy whole planets. And as we found out later from a tracking scan, the one we'd landed on had set a course for an unremarkable solar system, our solar system. Next arc is Klondathu. If you've seen the original film or read the book, you'll know exactly what this planet entails. The first episode starts out with Carmen manning the bridge. Marlowe makes a weird remark about... Not that I blame you for the ship lost on that ice planet bug thing, you know. Higgins films a piece on the captured warriors that are being transported to Earth, and Rico and Diz meet up with the rest of the team. Doc checks up on the med bay to see how Xander is doing. He notices his vitals are abnormal, and then something bursts out of it. Xander has now turned into a bug. Doc insists he can help, saying he's been infected by some bug virus. Lieutenant, listen to me carefully. You've been infected with some kind of bug virus. I I'm sure I can help. Now why would I want to be helped? The team then has some problems dealing with him as they attempt to stop him from reaching the bridge. He eventually gets there, but Brutal while trying to get out of a door, then has his legs crushed. You should have knocked first. Ah! Ah! Sarge! My legs! 
Xander flies the ship to an unknown planet and escapes out of a pod. I think I know why Xander was so intent on making it to this particular planet. The bug in him was going home. Next episode, Bruto is now out of action. The largest full-scale assault unfolds with... Every ship. Every trooper. I like how this scene mirrors the same news anchor in the beginning of the combat drop in the film. It's preferable to war with the bugs. Let me tell you something. I'm from Buenos Aires, and I say kill them all! Yeah! Oh, yeah! Right before the drop, Higgins announces a mail call. Bruto sends them a send-off message to wish them luck. Yo, Roughnecks. Sergeant F. Bruto here. Just wanted to prove to you apes I don't die easy. Scuttle buddies, you're about to take the big K. Now, I'm no good at stuff like this. Just remember to watch each other's backs. Live forever, apes! Rico? Isaac gives Rico squad leader now that Bruto is gone. Dizzy is addressed mail from Psycon saying that her brother has been killed in action. This makes her extremely saddened knowing she has lost a loved one. Isaac briefs them in the dropship saying they will eventually rendezvous with Zulu squad. Rico says an interesting remark about their Lieutenant Rockford to Tafai. Yeah. Lieutenant Rockford? You know how we say, when they made Razak, they broke the mold? Yes. Rockford's the guy who broke it. Hmm. Once they drop into battle and are on the planet, Razak notices Dizzy's performance is lacking. Her emotions may lead her to be a Section 8. He then says it's Rico's call because he is now squad leader. Rico asks what happened to her brother. Not exactly how I pictured a day at the beach with you. Yeah, well, sometimes things don't go like you plan. What gives, Diz? Equipment malfunction. Happens. Not to you. Tell me about the letter. My brother Eddie busted an ankle on Sigma-7. Must have busted that thing a dozen times playing ball. Never even slowed him down. He was on a medical transport back to Centauri. Plasma fire took it out. No survivors. Rico struggles with Diz to try and find middle ground. Once they find Zulu Squad, they help to destroy a large fortification of bugs. One of the Zulu squad members actually notices Dizzy's last name is Flores, saying he knows her brother. You disobeyed orders, Flores. It won't happen again, Sarge. Flores? Any relation to Eddie Flores? He was my brother. Was? He was shot down on medical transport last week. No way! Nobody could get Eddie on one of those flying ambulances. He stayed with his squad. You sure? Shook hands with him before I shipped out. He's alive! He's alive, Johnny! Turns out all is well, and Rico doesn't have to Section 8 Flores anymore. Next episode starts out with the Roughnecks in Base Camp Bullfrog. Higgins is put on guard duty. He notices a trooper walking strangely towards the main entrance. He lets the trooper in before noticing there's a bug's face in the suit. It bursts out of it and starts to attack the base. This bug is what is known as an imposter bug. No, no, I won't say it. No, no, you can't convince me to say it. One imposter sub. Razak's helmet is knocked off, but he's fine because the air is semi-breathable. Once it's killed and captured, Doc starts to dissect it and study it. He notices that it's been eating a red mold, which may act as a natural deterrent to viruses, like bug penicillin. This suggests the bugs deal with their own diseases. Higgins says a ship called the Dakota went down and they're moving out to go and retrieve survivors. Once they make their way over, the LT starts to cough. He must have breathed in something when his helmet got knocked off. In the Dakota, though, Rico asks Diz if there was something going on between them. Diz rejects him. Come on, what's with the deep freeze, Diz? I thought there was something going on between us. Was. Past tense, Johnny. Man, this dude just keeps getting L's handed to him. Goss looks at the security footage of the ship and sees imposter bugs got in and somehow accessed the computer. They contact General Red Wing in order to receive important personnel. The Dakota's ROM grid has been accessed and downloaded. No bug could download information from a computer, right? Get me an uplink to Psycon. Sorry, Gene. It's an intel matter. Information's on a need-to-know basis. When it's my squad sticking their necks out, I need to know. Before all transmission was severed, the crew's SOS reported that a humanoid had come aboard the ship with the arachnids. A Psycon officer. We traced the passcode that was used to access the ship's computer. The bugs appear to have a new leader. Major Xander Barkalow. 
Turns out the bug's new leader is none other than Xander Barkalo himself. Their new mission objective is to retrieve the missing troopers and terminate Barkalo. When I was freed from the control bug, I was allowed to redeem myself. It is unfortunate your Major Barkalo will not be afforded the same opportunity. Once they make their way up, they see a large mound. Clearly, he has to be in there somewhere. Razak then falls over from being sick. Then Doc suggests they go on another side quest to find the red mold the imposter bugs eat. They can use it to create a serum in order to help his vitals. Diz finds the mold, but also finds a group of troops from the Dakota. Clearly, they're imposter bugs using their suits, so Diz dispatches them. It's the troopers from the Dakota! Woohoo! We thought you guys were bug dumb. You guys must be starving! Here, bon appetit! Woman's intuition. The serum is completed, but it isn't certain if it works. Razak insists they leave him behind so he can cover the rear flank. As they make it into the mound, they see the troopers on the ceiling, covered in sticky webs. Doc checks their vitals and sees that their blood has been sucked. Red cell volume is markedly depleted. Plasma volume also down. Somebody did a Dracula on them. That would be me. <laughs> so nice to see the old gang again. Xander has completely changed to the final stage of the bug virus. Xander, tell them! Tell them you're still a trooper! No, I'm a arachnid! They can't immediately shoot him because he has two troopers to his left and right. They don't want to fire at them accidentally. This must be an offshoot of how the arachnids can use DNA from other animals which was seen in Tesca. Razak joins just in time. Seems his health has recovered from the serum. Surprise can be a very powerful weapon. <laughs> I couldn't agree more! Then a battle rages on inside the bug cave as they try to retrieve the missing troopers. Rico dispatches Xander's next generation of imposter bugs. Xander sneaks up on Rico though. Diz tries to change his mind. <laughs> it was a mistake coming here! But it will be your last! No! Xander, think about what you're doing! You were human once! I am Arachnid! Not all of you! Who's the pilot who saved this whole squad at Hopper Canyon? Who's the big dog? This is big dog. Do you remember that day we played volleyball at Segama Beach? <laughs> yes! You said, remind me to play on your team. Remind me to play on your team. I'll do that, partner. Well, here I am, reminding you. He switches sides right after Dizzy's speech and fights his own breed of bugs. I feel like he switched sides too easily here, but I know his interest in Diz probably brought his human side out. As the bug mount is crumbling, Rico says Doc can help him. I see you still fight dirty. Hard to fight to win. Rico and Xander! We have to do something! We're moving up, now! Rico, Xander, evac, now! Xander! It's too late for me. Doc can help you! Then the mound collapses, taking Xander with it. Xander's transformation was a cool take on the original film's character. The change even happened over two arcs as well, which gives the transformation a lot more development. He redeems himself to become a trooper in the end. In the end, Tafai was wrong. Xander did get his opportunity for redemption and was able to return, however briefly, to the man we once had known him to be, a trooper. Next episode shows the squad in the biggest bug siege yet. They attempt to evac, but the Zephyr crashes. The squad gives notice to Valley Forge, but Marlow says all troopers are to stay put until bug forces die down. 
They hunkered down in a base that had recently been occupied by another squadron. For now, they just have to dig in and hold the line. Higgins sees a letter a trooper wrote on the ground that was never finished. Thinking about your family? My children. Oh, I can see the resemblance. My dear sweet Kathy, it is only the thought of you which keeps me going. I wish I could. Huh. That's all it says. I guess the trooper never had a chance to finish it. That is the tragedy of war, is it not? Never having said what needed to be said. Never saying goodbye to the ones you love. This gives Higgins an idea to film everyone saying a message to their families back home. First off, he films Tafal giving a message to his kids. Tafal. Moret. It is your father. I hope someday you will understand why I couldn't be there now to share in your lives. But I fight so you will not have to. So your children will not have to. Do not forget me, my loves, for I never forget you. I don't think they will. Then he asks Goss. Hey Goss, I was talking with Tafai about missed opportunities and it got me thinking. Sounds like trouble already. Hand me the ratchet, would you? Uh, sure. Which one? Like I was saying, Tafai taped a message to his kids, just in case. You know, it seemed like a good idea, so I was wondering if anybody else... It's bad luck for a trooper to say goodbye, Hig. It's also bad luck to be outnumbered by a horde of bugs. Higgins, I'd love to chat, but I'm a little busy right now. Right. Sorry. Victoria. I'd say goodbye. Hello to Victoria. Hey, Vicky. Greetings from the armpit of the galaxy, Clendathu. Listen, things are a little intense here, bugwise, so I just wanted to tell you how much I miss you. I, I joined to prove something. To myself, I guess, prove I was brave, but. I'm not the brave one in the family, little sister. You are. You're my inspiration. As long as you keep fighting, I will too. Take care, Squirt. I love you. She sounds pretty special. I got a lot of work here, Higgins. This scene without fail every time has always made me cry. Bill Fingerback, he knows exactly what he's doing. Then the emotional moment is cut with Diz screaming. They're attacked again, but this time by blisters. The squad holds them off, but Doc, however, gets hit by acid. His suit starts leaking oxygen. With the repair kit melted, Razak suggests they grab Cheyenne's squad's repair kit. Rico and Ibanez then go out to retrieve it. Before Carmen leaves, Higgins then asks Carmen to give a message to her family. Lieutenant, I don't want to sound like the Grim Reaper, but do you have anything you want to say to anyone back home? Um, just in case? Mom, Dad... Seems for as long as I can remember, we butted heads. I know it can be stubborn. Carmen, you don't have any idea what you're getting yourself into. I'm 18! I don't need your permission to join PsyCon! But all I ever wanted to be was a trooper. Maybe I should have found the time to be your daughter as well. I don't know. Carmen, let's move. Hey, Rico, how about you? Oh no, not ready for a will yet, camera boy. After Rico and Abanez leave, Diz asks Higgins if she can record a message. Higgins. <sighs> Heard you've been collecting goodbyes. Kinda. I guess this is as good a time as any. Rolling. This is for my brother, Eddie. <clears throat> hey, what's the matter, Diz? Too physical for ya? Ha! No such thing, bro! What do you know? Psycon says you're MIA, but they couldn't find their own heads with a three-sided mirror. I know you're out there somewhere. I will find you. And when I do, first thing I want to do is kick your butt in one-on-one -on -one again! Rico and Carmen meet Cheyenne, but they seem to be having troubles of their own. However, they push the bugs back and Rico is rewarded with the repair kit. 
While Doc is being taken care of, a large horde of bugs approaches. We got bugs. How many? All of them. Launcher's still out of commission. Best I can do is rig a delay on the missiles themselves, then blow the entire pile in the trench. Excuse me, sir, but aren't we in the trench? Never said the plan was perfect. Rico and Abanas now have to make their way through No Man's Land, where the bugs are approaching from. Meanwhile, Higgins films Doc. Hey, what month is it? April, I think. Uh, April, spring, green. I miss the green of Earth. The smell of mowed grass, the taste of fresh lemonade. Uh, I miss sleep, real sleep. Not having to sleep with one eye open all the time. Promise you won't leave me on this snot green rock, Higgins. Promise no matter what happens, you'll get me back home. I promise. I like here how he's not talking about his family back home, but the pleasures of living back on Earth. Rico and Carmen return with the filter, and Doc is back in action. Goss has an idea to blow the entire trench once they're out of the explosion's range. Prior to having to take out another wave of bugs before leaving, Higgins says it's Rico's last chance to film a message. We hold our ground until my order, then fall back. Goss will blow the trench. Read me roughnecks! Sir! sir yes, sir! sir. Last chance, Rico. All my life, I've been on my own. I've trusted almost nobody. Things have changed. What does that to you? In battle, you count on your fellow troopers, because well, they count on you. It's a good feeling. I'm just sorry that some of those apes couldn't be here now, so I can tell them in person. Goss sets the timers, and they get out of there. Somehow avoiding a nuclear explosion, they still see more bugs are approaching. We win? Afraid not. Last dance. We go out like troopers. Didn't know there was any other way. A privilege serving with you all. Feelings mutual. Together at last. Yeah. Just the way I pictured it. However, there are spaceships that blow them all up before they move up to a ridge. Looks like you're all gonna live to fight another day, apes. This is where Higgins asks Razak to record a message. Sir, uh, I never had a chance to ask. Did you want to say something to the folks on Earth? Or to your family? This is my family. Ah, family bonding. While watching a nuclear explosion, how wholesome. This was another one of my favorite episodes, mainly for the fact it made me emotional and also the fact it added a huge amount of character development. Against the odds, we'd held our position that day. And for a brief moment, we'd remembered what and who we were fighting for. You're always in my thoughts, Mom and Dad. I love you both. Keep the porch light on for me. I'll be home soon. Next episode starts with the squad clearing out another bug mound. After a long day of clearing bugs, the squad tries to rest, but they are interrupted to go into the briefing room. I'm gonna- On your feet, Roughnecks! Strategy room, now! <sighs> Something you wanted to say to the LT, Rico? Echo Squad. Check out the starch in those power suits. The Sky Marshal himself appears to give information. There is a queen bug that they must destroy. At ease! Since we landed on this rock, I know you troopers have heard the scuttlebutt concerning a queen bug. I am here to tell you, the rumors are true. The queen's a bug-making machine. 75 eggs per hour, 1,800 eggs per day. 
The solution? Hit her where she lives. Don't let this pile of dirt fool you. It is Bug Central with the Queen heavily guarded. Any full frontal assault would alert literally thousands of warriors. So... Here it comes. We'll drop suit two squads into the Queen's backyard. Two insertion points, one goal. Exterminate the Queen. Don't let Earth down. That is all. Carl returns, but he is emotionless and cold. He's been reassigned to his squad so he can help them locate the Bug Queen. Rico tries to console with him, but he's distant. He overhears Doc say something in his head. You don't really think you can complete this mission without me, do you, Doc? I didn't say anything. Not out loud. Carl is now a full-fledged telepath. The two squads make their way towards the Queen's location and drop in. Carl locates the entry point and they move in. Higgins fires at a bug from afar, but this causes rocks to fall everywhere. Carl avoids being hit by rocks by using the force somehow, but Goss makes a remark and Carl gets upset. Carl? Carl, look out! And the creepy just get creepier. Carl, no! Huh? Jenkins! While you wear that patch, you'll act like a roughneck. Understood? Yes, sir. Inside the mound, they jump into a hole. Defy sees a pitworm. Pitworm. Basically blind, but one screech will alert many. The worm cuts off Doc and Diz's lines, and they fall into a big spider web. Tons of pitworms appear, and the squad has to fight them off. Rico and Goss save them both and carry them up. <sighs> Don't think this means we're going steady. Once the web is cut through, they follow to the bottom. Jenkins is called forward to help them navigate. Carl says that there are bugs everywhere surrounding them. Then they appear out of nowhere. Jenkins falls down somewhere and his helmet is knocked off. The squad continues onwards toward their objective. But there's something wrong. There are no bugs. Then they are suddenly ambushed once more. This time the queen herself is present, holding Carl as a shield. Rico is told to fire, but he hesitates. Carl insisting. Rico then gets knocked down by a nubile warrior. Carl tries to levitate his rifle towards him, Rico then shoots at the queen and it moves out of the way. Then shoots at stalactites and they fall to crush it. Carl escapes but the queen is still alive. It escapes. The squad then being cornered by bugs needs Carl to be in service again. Rico then goes to get his helmet. Carl puts it back on and he's back in action. Carl kills them all with his mind. I don't remember them teaching that in basic. Dude doesn't need a weapon. He is a weapon. He's gonna blow! Carl, stop! It's over! Johnny? Rico has to snap him out. It seems his telepathy is controlling him more than he is. They come upon a layer of eggs with the queen in sight once again. Carl approaches the queen. Johnny fires at it, but the rock falls, allowing it to escape. Higgins finds it boarding a transport. It gets inside, but Carl tries to hold it back. He can't hold onto it any longer, and it escapes. The Roughnecks once again failed to destroy the queen, and now it's heading somewhere. Where do you think she's headed? Earth. Victory had slipped through our fingers that day, and we all knew it. Carl was back, sort of, and the queen was on her way to Earth. Suddenly, the bug war felt very, very personal. Next arc is the Tracker's arc. This arc has four additional bonus episodes, making this arc the longest at a whopping hour and 40 minutes. But personally, I don't count it being the longest because majority of these episodes are the very same clip show and flashback episodes I talked about in the beginning. The first episode entitled Trackers is exactly what you'd expect. It starts with Razak being briefed on them trying to track down the queen that escaped from Klandathu. Wait, why is the guy from the Sequoia still alive? What happened? He's a clown! Meanwhile, the squad gets another mail call. This time, Higgins gets a video of his girlfriend on Earth breaking up with him. Sound familiar? 
Diz tries to console with them, but they are interrupted by a report to battle stations. They picked up the transport on sensors. Once in the turret, Rico asks Flores what happened. What was his story? Uh, I didn't get the details, but I think we're talking Splitsville. I am not familiar with Splitsville. You know, the dear John. Faced. Let's be friends. Higgins got dumped by his girlfriend. Mm. With the transport in range, the fighters are undocked and deployed. It starts shooting bogeys at the ship. Lasers! Keep those bugs busy with cover fire! Man, it's such a cool concept to see the plasma bugs on the top of the transport bug firing as if they're main ship cannons. The fighters bomb the bugs on top. Marlo orders to take them in close. Hold your course. Five seconds. Critical thrusters, now! Missile launchers, fire! Man, this guy knows how to fly a ship. He contacts Psycon to say the Queen has been destroyed, but turns out other ships around different quadrants have destroyed decoys. Meanwhile, the squad tries to get on good terms with Higgins, but he leaves the room. He never tells us much, now that you mention it. Seems like all Paperboy ever does is ask questions. It's weird. I mean, we've all been together a while, and I know tons of stuff about you guys. Some of it private. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention in the Pluto arc, Dizzy gets with Goss for a little bit. I left that out though as to allow people to actually go and watch the show, but you're already this far into the video, so either you don't care or you've already seen it. Higgins then comes back into the room and they all ask him about his breakup. So, what's the problem, Higgins? What are you talking about? We're talking about what people do when they're friends. Like talk about their families, their girlfriends, their recent loss of girlfriends. What? You don't trust us or something? It's not that. I've just always been better at asking questions than answering them. Why do you think I became a reporter? This isn't about you guys. My life just isn't all that interesting. It's a load, Hig. Everybody's got something. Yeah? Not anymore. That's it? That's all we get? I'm feeling rather unsatisfied. All right, all right. Let's turn the heat off him. Dude's been through enough. Poor Hig. Jenkins notices that the real queen is making a detour towards Earth and will arrive in less than 48 hours. Once they arrive, they all return to battle stations once again. It looks like they destroyed for a second, but it starts to make a quick escape. Goss then makes a funny remark, but Razak thinks it's a good idea. Now what? Bake her a cake with a nuke inside and leave it on her front door? Something like that. They're going to enter into the Queen and land a nuke inside. They're also going to need a large distraction to get that close. Battle is then recommenced. Same tactics as before are used. Plasma is shot at and the Roughneck's ship makes its way in. After some problems with Ripplers, they continue further inside the bug. This is the third time now that they've been inside a large, space-faring bug. Once inside, Carl helps them navigate once again, allowing them to avoid bug patrols. He says the queen is near, so they all lay low. Razak asks if it's the real thing. Jenkins, you sure this time? Yes, sir. It's the real deal. Very well. Gossard, prep a tow charge with the mini-nukes. Listen up, apes. Getting out of here in one piece is a long shot. But we don't take out the Queen right here, right now. The war is coming to Earth. Everybody get that? Sir, yes, sir. They set the charges, but are ambushed by bugs. They're going to have to escape while being chased. Razak calls Ibanez to retrieve them. Carmen, being a master pilot, makes it through easily. They get inside and fly out, Star Wars Episode Six style, with the transport exploding behind them. Once the mission is over, they return to Earth. Carl can feel the Queen is still alive, though. She made it to Earth. Then the episode ends. And then little kid me was like, what? That was it? Because I was too dumb to know there was a bonus feature section on the menu screen. Next episode entitled Pluto and Beyond is a recap episode of both Pluto and Tophet. This episode is framed as a documentary piece that Higgins narrates. 
I'm a bit confused as to why he describes there's a war on two fronts with Pluto and Tophet when the campaign after Pluto was Hydora. Oh well, I guess it was just so they could fill in the episode time slot. Next episode after is Propaganda Machine. This one, again, is another documentary by Higgins. He's supposed to be making a positive, upbeat piece about the life in the mobile infantry for FedNet. Higgins has trouble doing so. But this is another recap of various campaigns throughout the series thus far. After watching the series, these are a nice extra bit to enjoy so I won't spoil too much. I've also noticed that sometimes the theme song and the ending credits music are sped up in certain instances. Must be a time saving measure. A lot of shows do this so it's not surprising. Third extra episode is Marooned. During a drop, Rico has his drop suit malfunction and he's left to drift out in space. His locator beacon is damaged, so he's left to hope they'll find him on their own. During his struggle to survive, he has flashbacks to various missions and campaigns. Again, I won't go into much because most of it was already discussed. It's a great bonus episode though, I would definitely recommend. Last bonus episode is my favorite of this arc, or I guess bonus section. The Court Martial of Lieutenant Razak. After dropping a bomb on a plasma zone and clearing the bugs out to land, Lieutenant Walker gives him a message. Lieutenant, your orders were to hold all fire until you were on the surface. There were troopers in that sector you just leveled. That, that intel was unavailable. Secret op, need to know basis only. You didn't need to know. You should have just followed orders. We've lost communication with the six squads in the area, and General Red Wing personally was in command of those troopers. Uh oh, his dummy GF isn't gonna like this one when she hears it. Walker is a recurring character that butts heads with Razak throughout the series. He issues a court-martial to commence with Razak. Walker describes some problems with his squad, like Higgins flying the skimmer untrained, him losing his first squad, stuff like that. Just a big flashback episode, but it's framed in a perfect way to do so. The squad separately has to give their own testimony and debate to Walker to say their opinions on Razak. Each one is always positive, showing their own personal growth together and showing Razak as their valued lieutenant. Right before they can sentence Razak, he notices that a general has been feeding intel to the bugs. He's been controlled by a control bug. Red Wing calls in, letting them know she's still alive. We've got your back, lieutenant. Red Wing, you're alive. My squads are in crossfire position. Any bug retreat will be sealed off. says intel isn't on the ball. We knew there was an internal security breach, so Lieutenant Razak and I came up with this plan to flush him out. What, the whole thing was a setup? Secret up. Need to know basis only. You didn't need to know. This was all a ploy to get the bug trader to draw himself out and destroy the advancing bug forces. Really shows how good of a trooper Razak really is. Maybe Lieutenant Walker knew a little better what kind of a leader Razak really was. As for the Roughnecks, and that was no secret at all. The next and final arc is Homefront. It starts with the team running track, wondering what they're still doing on duty, even though to them the war is over. When the Queen's transport bug was destroyed, there wasn't an official treaty or peace accord to sign. But the war was effectively over, and Sycon got down to the business of peace. That's right! Walk away, babies! Thousands of lucky troopers were immediately released from duty. The rest of us awaited reassignment. But hey, we weren't fighting the bugs anymore, so things were looking up. While this is going on, Carl talks to Red Wing about him hearing the Queen speaking to him. Red Wing then insists he goes to have orders for R&R. &R. He then talks to Rico about his gripes with the situation while he packs. Hey, going AWOL? R&R, &R. General's orders. Sweet, I just swing that. I told her the Queen's still alive. I assume you think I'm whacked too. Uh, yeah, well, we did blow her up and uh, you were there. I'm the one who got up close and personal with the Queen. I'm the one who got inside that brain bug. And I'm the one who saved our butts. If I remember correctly, you didn't doubt me then. That was different. Why? You were different. I'd say the war has changed us both, Sergeant. Rico tells LT about Carl's ability to tell there are still bugs on Earth. 
LT regretfully accepts disobeying their orders that will take them to the Jovian moons. Instead, they're going to Little Butte, North Dakota because they've seen thermal spikes irregular from patterns of satellite data. New orders. Repairing radio telescope receivers on the Jovian moons? We'll leave on a fleet transport out of San Francisco day after tomorrow. Lieutenant, request leave until departure. So you can chase some figment of Carl's imagination? Request denied. With all due respect, sir, you have to let me do this. Rico, I don't have to do anything. I better not regret this. Whoa, 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 wait, wait, go back. Go back. There. What are those flares? Heat signatures. Above and below ground. Could be volcanic activity or hydrothermal pockets. But there's no way to tell for sure by just looking at the sat photo. You have to compare it to a seismic scan of the area. Negative on Volcano and Hydro. Something else is going on. I'm a bit confused as to why an entire spacefaring military didn't see this. Maybe they were too confident in winning and they didn't bother to check. Once in town, they have some trouble with the locals. Turns out they are disguised cloaking bugs. Really gives some grim implications as to what happened. Once they know bugs are present on Earth, Razek lets Red Wing know after she questions him not following orders. Red Wing to Alpha Team, come in Alpha Team, over. If you can hear me, Razak, I strongly advise you to respond immediately. Red Wing, this is Alpha Team. Read you, over. Lieutenant, you were to have your squad on transport out of San Francisco one hour ago. What is your current position? Five miles southwest of Little Butte, North Dakota, over. No one authorized a detour in your travel orders, Lieutenant Razak. Explain yourself, over. General. I take full responsibility for disobeying orders and will accept disciplinary action. Later. But Jenkins was right. We've got bugs. Oh no. Carl says that they're going to target multiple areas, including a cold fusion plant nearby that supplies power for nearly half the United States. Once in there, they take it and then they stop the meltdown, with two seconds to spare. Next episode starts in a mission to take back Buenos Aires. Bugs. Let me tell you something. I'm from Buenos Aires, and I say kill them all! Yeah! Oh yeah! Yeah! Oh yeah! Also, look at the funny alien symbol here with the actual aliens of the show next to it. LT! Swarm! Move out! Uh, I can handle them! This isn't a discussion, Private! Move out! Uh. Rico Diz! Three words for you. Hit the deck! Interesting strategic positioning. This arc also returns to explore Rico and Diz's relationship. Once in the bunk, Rico tries to talk to Diz about what's going on between them. Need a hand? I got it. I'm a big girl, Sergeant. Diz, I was just trying to... Help? Yeah, I know, just like in the alley. What are you talking about? The alley, now my backpack. I don't see you offering to help Doc. I would if he asked. Yeah, well, I didn't ask. <laughs> you could read me a bedtime story. Meanwhile, Razek talks to Red Wing about a bug mound that they cannot destroy by air. A covert mission behind enemy lines is the only way to go. So they make their way to the mound and set up camp with fake bushes. Once the squad comes in to move the bug forces away from them, they move in. Rico has issues with Ripplers, but the team helps him fight them off. Diz, however, falls down a cliff and Rico goes in to save her. This is where he confesses. Diz, when you went over that ledge, my heart stopped. Yeah, right. I'm serious. All these feelings just started crashing over me, and then, well, it became so clear. Rico, my head hurts. Dizzy, I love you. <sighs> Welcome back, soldier. Kind of dropping a ball there, Rico, goodness. They can't use weapons fire or break radial silence because it may alert the bugs. A squad throws a grenade and alerts all the plasma positions, but it does show all their positions at once, giving them a chance to nuke them all. They swiftly take out the mound and then return to base. This is where Rico and Diz confront each other about feelings. Diz, 
Wait up. Uh, don't you think we should talk? About what? Oh, about you being in love with me. Well, you can't be. What's that supposed to mean? Just what I said. You can't love me, Rico. I'm a jinx. Bad stuff happens to everyone I care about. Come on, Tiz. That's nuts. You want a list? Let's start with my family. Gone. Thought I had feelings for Carl? Oops, his brain got fried. Xander turned into a bug. There's one flaw in your theory, Diz. What's that? Me. You're in love with me, and I'm still here. Yeah? Well, obviously, I'm not in love with you anymore. That's why you're safe. Diz, I'm not gonna let you do this. I'm not just gonna walk away. Sergeant, you outrank me, remember? I believe Psycon Command would consider this sort of behavior wholly inappropriate. Fine, Private. I'm sorry if I was out of line. It won't happen again, I promise. This is the first time I've seen a character show on screen tears, which gives a big emotional impact to this arc. Next episode starts with Higgins narrating. Seven months after the bugs invaded Earth, the entire planet was basically a battlefield. All the landmarks we once knew were now unrecognizable. Psycon forces seemed to have the upper hand. Every major bug had been stopped in its tracks. Until... Roughnecks! Full pursuit! After a quick skirmish, they meet at a mess hall. LT, what the heck is this stuff? Top secret, Sergeant. But I believe it's codenamed to be mashed potatoes. Man, they really had their taste buds thrashed after eating deep space food for so long. Meanwhile, Razek is called in to brief with Sky Marshal Sanchez. He says there are bugs underneath San Francisco. The only way to take them out is to airstrike the area, leaving the civilians' lives to be a necessary sacrifice. But Walker and Razak hear this and decide to take middle ground on the fact that they will not let them kill innocent lives. They hatch a plan. The only way to shut down the enemy in time is to drive all the subterranean forces above ground at once. Now, because portions of the bug's network run beneath the city's main waterways, we propose setting a series of underwater charges along key sections of the insect tunnels. These charges will be armed with our last reserves of toxin B3, which has proven to be lethal to bugs even when heavily diluted. The explosions will cause massive holes in the tunnel walls, allowing water to rush in and flush out the bugs. Enemy forces will either drown will be driven to the surface, where MI forces will be waiting en masse. Well, you have 12 hours. If you fail, the initial full-scale airstrike will commence, leaving no time for any evacuations, civilian or military. Once the two squads are in a retrieval ship, this funny scene with Defy and Goss unfolds. Let me see if I understand this. If we blow it, our side blows us up. In a nutshell. I feel so much better now. Because I crave the pump! That's right! Bring it on! Think they're buying it? Oh, yes. Very convincing. Although Walker's squadron looks a bit strange. Like, for example, this guy looks like a fish person. Oh yeah, the pilot of the ship just sounds like Higgins doing a deep voice. Approaching drop site. Prepare for deployment. However, after some issues with more bugs, the ship crashes and they will all have to stay in one skimmer to set the bombs. It's a bit strange the entire population of San Francisco couldn't see the giant wave of ripplers in the sky, but oh well, they're Californians, they're all dumb. Once they set the bombs with heavy resistance, they notice that the countdown isn't starting. Rico and Razek both go down to try and manually reset them. However, once Rico and Razek resurface, it's strangely quiet. Come on, LT! You're clear!
Sergeant Rico, where's Lieutenant Razak? Gone. What? It cannot be. No. Gossard, then make the charges. Razak's sacrifice was not in vain, because it allowed the mobile infantry to secure Frisco and save thousands of lives. He will be remembered as the hero of the squad and for the rest of the mobile infantry for years to come. Bugs have however hit more cities. With Razak gone, the team is left in disarray. Sergeant, I'm sorry. He never left a man behind. Rico. Don't do this. You made the right decision. That's the kind of officer Razak trained you to be. Lieutenant Walker, emergency briefing in 10. Bugs have hit a dozen more cities. It's bad. Understatement. Would somebody please tell me what we do now? Next episode starts with the squad having to be split up due to Razak being gone, however they have 36 hours before they have to report to be reassigned. One final mission left, to spread Razak's ashes and to carry out his dying wishes. Sergeant Brito is back, in a floating wheelchair no less. Farther than you can walk, you bipad. And don't even think about hitching with me. Hey, Sarge! I oh, can't believe I'm saying this, but you're a sight for sore eyes. As if we don't have enough problems. Hey, nice wheels. It ain't exactly an all-terrain vehicle, but that's not gonna stop me from paying my respects. Good to see you, Sarge. Yeah, you too, Sarge. Man, was I irreplaceable or what? <laughs> Red Ring also is there at the funeral. Rico tries to ask her to help them not split up, but she cannot assign a new LT to them. As they make their way to the lake, Higgins and Bruto talk to each other. <laughs> Chair gives me a lousy 10 centimeter clearance off the ground. Um, do you want some help? Uh, help? Yeah, I managed for months without any help from you meatballs. So don't go making me your next sob story. Oh, I, I wasn't gonna- Where's your camera anyway? I thought it was attached to your wrist. I thought this should be private, just for us. Yeah, that's how I'd want it. If you look closely, they are all wearing JR armbands, and the armbands are black, signifying that they have a person on their squad who has died. Earlier in the series, you can see them wearing a grey one, for Carl Jenkins. The grey meaning that he was still alive. Rico asks if the area has changed much between her and Razak had been there, and Red Wing does say that it's a bit odder than before. She notices there's a deafening silence. Sound familiar? I wish it didn't. Bugs. Code Red Roughnecks. Your orders, General. I don't disagree with your assessment, Sergeant, but I hate to divert troops to a non-combat zone based only on a suspicion and a lack of noise. Is there any way we can get confirmation? <laughs> they spot workers and tanker worms, but warriors chase them. As they are chased by tanker worms, Red Wing and Higgins fall into a pit. They maintain their retreat, but Bruto gets knocked off his chair and it falls down a cliff. As they are cornered at a ledge, warriors chase them so they have no choice but to fall down. Somehow, they make it just fine, and Tafai is asked to call in reinforcements. Meanwhile, Higgins and Red Wing are moved around by workers. I guess we're lucky to be alive. I doubt it's luck. They're saving us for something. Must be a brain bug again. The nearby Strawberry Park station has been infested with bugs. Repeat, this is Alpha Team, Steamboat Terminal. Do you read? Colonel, give it a rest. Help's not coming anytime soon. You never have been one to ask for help. And now I'm not worth helping. Tonight's only proven what I guessed that night I first woke up in the hospital. I'm useless to you guys. Worthless, damaged goods. You are none of those things. I'm worse. I'm a liability. Good news. Paperboy and Red Wing are still alive. Listen up, apes. We need a diversion. Something to draw the bugs away from the hostages so we can make the grab. There'll be pursuit. Not if we drop that mountain on their heads. Gossard, is there any way we can blow the thing? I have nothing to work with here. 
Brudo, I need your chair. Ah. As Goss removes the power pack from the chair, he has an idea to use them as makeshift bombs to bring down the rocks, smashing the nest. You should just leave me sitting here. The roughnecks never leave a man behind. I'm not a roughneck anymore. I'm not even a man anymore. I agree. Huh? You are no longer a roughneck. But the problem is not here. It is here. Rico orders to fight to kill Redwing if he cannot kill the brain. Redwing has a ton of intel that the bugs could use. Brudo, however, has an idea. Sarge, hold on. Have Doc blow his package. Gossard's not in position yet, and we can't afford to wait. Don't have to. I'm motorized, and it's a clear slope down. I can get in and out faster than you or Flores. How does that help? If Brudo makes the grab, it frees us to provide cover fire from multiple locations. If we keep the bugs confused, they'll still be in place when Gossard's finally ready to drop the house on him. Trying to jump on the gun here, ain't ya? They jump the gun on the explosions, and Brudo uses his chair to bring both Higgins and Redwing back out of captivity. They fire at the remaining pack barely in time, and the rocks smash the brain. Redwing then promotes Rico to LT, because Redwing decides the squad this effective cannot be split up. Thanks for the save, Sergeant. I'm not complaining. But you should have killed me to keep what I know from that brain. That was plan B. Very good. There's no way I'm allowing a unit this effective to be split up. You'll assign us a new lieutenant? No, I don't have one to spare. Then... I'm offering you a battlefield promotion, son. Me? An LT? But what about officers' training school and all that? You can play cadet when the war is over. Do you want the job or not? Not? <clears throat> but I'll take it. Till I'm history, or you find someone better. This was also a line taken out of the original film. I need a corporal. You're it until you're dead, or till I find somebody better. Lieutenant Gene Razak died in the line of duty on day 210 of the battle for planet Earth. His last request was that we drop his ashes over Luna Lake at sunrise. It was day 212, and sunrise had long since passed. But we figured the LT would understand. Next episode starts with a news report on the war on Earth. Bruto also lets them know someone has joined their squad, Bruto's own son, Max. Rico then says they need to go to Psycon HQ. They're evacuating all citizens out of the area. Once they get there, they see Sergeant Zim once again. Defy tries to talk to Max as well, but is given attitude. Max also gives attitude to the rest of the team. Uh, at ease. Congratulations on your promotion, sir. Um, uh, yeah, thanks, Sergeant. Um, uh, nice to see you. In one piece. Sir, I am fit. And the incident to which you allude is forgotten, sir. Great. It is good to see you again, Sergeant. But away from Camp Curry... Curry's been shuttered. We've trained every able body we're gonna find. I'm just chaperoning this last batch of borderline washouts en route to their new mamas. <laughs> like I need a babysitter. Zip it, Private. Sir, this is Private Max Bruto assigned to your unit. His old man was your top kick, I believe. Gone but not forgotten. Where's the Sergeant's replacement? Some shoes are hard to fill, others are impossible. All right, Private, I'm leaving you in good hands. Don't squirm. Rest of you runs, follow me. I am Private Tafai. 
Oh, right. Yeah, Dad told me about you. Best skinny in the infantry. Real high praise. However, Ripplers then attack from above. Psycon HQ is under attack. Tons more bugs show they're making their way towards the base. Zim then self-assigns himself to the Roughnecks to help them fight the bugs off. They retreat to take back the outpost. With the comm tower gone, Goss and Doc propose to move the antenna back to re-establish the connection. But the bugs return to attack with another wave. Rico orders them to get off the roof. Rico overhears Max talk about him, saying how Razak was better. How about a battle plan instead, huh? The bugs are making us look like idiots here! I mean, what's with the LT? It's like the only roughneck worth the lick was the dead guy, Razak! Oh, I'm gonna tear that jerk! Johnny, you're not buying that garbage. It's his first battle. He's scared. Besides, the guy's a brudo. Foot genetically inserted in mouth. No one else is saying- I'm thinking it. I mean, I'm thinking it. I'm not Razak. No one's asking you to be Razak. We have faith in Rico, and we'll put our lives on the line to prove it. That's the problem, Diz. I'm gonna get you all killed. Lieutenant, how do you want the men deployed? I am assigning myself guard duty on the balcony. Everything else, Sergeant Zim, is your call. Permission to speak freely, sir. Oh, for crying out loud, speak all you want. Take charge, I am begging you. Not what I want, not why I came. You need to know some hard facts. One, you were assigned to me in basic for an arrangement made by your high school teacher, Gene Razak. Two, you were assigned to Razak's Roughnecks per an arrangement made by your basic training instructor, me. Gene and I were friends a long time. We usually saw eye to eye, and you were no exception. From day one, we had you pegged as a leader. <laughs> Why? Look in the mirror, kid. You're young, but in every way that counts, you couldn't be more like Gene Razak if you tried. What if you were wrong? What if Razak was wrong? If you respect Gene Razak as much as you claim, you won't be concerned with proving him wrong. Rico, then with newfound determination, begins to explain another plan. Rico is finally understanding how to be a leader. With Rico's new plan, they cover Goss and Doc to get the tower restored. With communications returned, they hear a large-scale bug assault has destroyed the Psycon HQ. Rico hears Carmen and asks for her to pick them up. Goss then sets a large nuke to go off as they hide in a bomb shelter. The explosion takes out tons of the bug's forces. Carmen lands after the explosion and they return to the Valley Forge. Rico's Roughnecks held out longer and did more damage than any other squad. You should be proud. Rico's Roughnecks. Did you lose your bars in battle? However, Carl gets something. Uh, it's coming. Uh, Carl? It already came. No. It hasn't begun. But Carl was only half right. The end was near. The final battle. Humanity's last stand was just around the corner. Then the series ends there with a last stand final battle originally going to take place after. I'm still extremely upset at this cliffhanger, but I guess this is the part where I play the scene from the movie where they're all like, but they'll keep fighting, and they'll win! But I already mentioned why this was all cancelled in the beginning and whatnot, but thank you to whoever stuck with me throughout this entire video and experienced the series with me. It took me quite a while to make this, so uh, I need to return to playing Helldivers. Live forever, apes. a thousand times. Stop coming over to random Wendy's and talking about random niche cartoons. It's annoying. Order some food already or get out.